The title of this message is The Unpardonable Sin. Welcome to our worship service. The psalmist says in Psalm 130 verses 3 and 4, If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, that you may be feared. Let's turn to our great God in prayer and ask for his blessing on our time of worship. Let us now pray. Heavenly Father and gracious God, we thank you again for the greatness of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that we can approach you, our Father. We thank you that we can come to you through him. We praise you for our great Saviour. We praise you for our great Lord Jesus. Father, we do thank you, our God, especially for his precious blood. We thank you that on the cross, the Lord Jesus died for our sins. And we thank you that he shed his blood so that we may have our sins forgiven and have peace with you. We thank you that we can approach you. We thank you that we can approach you through that wonderful name and through the wonderful merits of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for your blessing on our time together. We ask, O God, for the help and the agency of your Holy Spirit to be upon us. We ask that we would be led on a right of you. We pray for your blessing. We pray for your help. We pray for your strength. Give us mercy and peace and blessing and joy. We ask, O Lord, that we would have something of heaven upon earth as we meet with you. Oh, Father, we praise your great name. We worship you, our God. We praise you that you are great. We thank you that you are glorious. And we ask, O God, for communion with you. And we pray that this time of fellowship would be meaningful. We pray that it would be blessed of you. Father, we turn again to you and pray that you would feed our never-dying souls. We ask that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ would be upon us. May we be filled with the Holy Spirit. May you have all the worship and the adoration and the praise, O oh God. But also we acknowledge our sins before you. We come before you and we confess, O oh God, that we are sinners. We know ourselves, O oh Lord, to be offensive toward you because you are holy and your standards are holy and you are perfect, O oh God. And when we compare ourselves with you, Father, we fall far short of what we should be. We are sinners. We are those, O oh Lord, who have come short time and again. And we do pray for your forgiveness. We ask that you would pardon us through the cleansing, refreshing blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Asking for you to help. Asking for you to cleanse and refresh us and to do us good. Oh, may we concentrate on you. Pardon us, we pray. Renew us. Keep us in the way. Quicken us in the way. We pray that you would help our feet on this earth to be walking in a steady pace toward you. Be near us in our pilgrimage, we pray. Give us every grace in Jude. We pray for your help. Oh, Father, we do ask, O oh Lord, for your touch to be upon us. Be near us in these difficult days. Help us, our oh Father. Encourage us this time of worship. May you be praised and may you be glorified. May you be honoured and uplifted. We thank you again for the technology that enables us to meet in this way, that enables us to have this online service. And we ask, O oh God, then, for your smile and for your blessing to be upon us. Be near us in every way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Bible reading is taken from the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 20 to the end of verse 30. That's Mark's Gospel, chapter 3, beginning to read at verse 20 and ending at the end of verse 30. Let's hear God's word. Then the multitude came together again, so that they could not so much as eat bread. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hands hold of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons. 
So he called them to himself and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but has an end. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will pardon his, plunder his house. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men and whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation, because they said he has an unclean spirit. I'm going to show you some words, and I want you to imagine that I'm in front of you and that you're here as it were in church but I wonder if you can identify what words are these what was special about these words okay see if you can guess what's special about these words anything special about them see if you can get this on the very first word can you see that anyone I wonder if you've got it already if you've got it already What's special about these words? Can you see it? It's madam. Wonder if there's any real bright boxes that have really got it. What about that? Have you got it now? I'm getting harder and then I'll get easier, okay? So it's harder now and then it will get easier. What about that? Have you got it yet? Have you got it? What's special about them? There's no connection between the words. It's, it's about each individual word, okay? So don't try, try, don't try and think that there's a link between madam and level. There's something special about each of these words. What is it? Level. Have you, see if you can get it now. Deed. Have you got it yet? Have you got it? Then we go down to three letter words. Dad. Mum, Bib, and finally, Bob. Have you got it? I hope you have. Yeah, of course you've got it. It is that they are the same spelt forwards as they are backwards. Madam, M-A-D-A-M, M-A-D-A-M. Did you get it? Have you got that? It's clever, isn't it? There's quite a few words in the English language that are like that. And what about this one? Level. L-E-V-E-L. L-E-V-E-L. That's clever, isn't it? Eh? Clever. Have you ever learned about them? Have you ever learned about them at school? And then, of course, we've got other ones, four-letter words. There's D-D-E-D. D-D-E-D. -D -D -E -D. It's good, isn't it? It's clever. It's the same. In fact, there's a fancy word for these for these types of words. Did you know there's a fancy word for them? They're palindromes. Do you know that? Oh, that's a long word, isn't it? Palindromes. Same spelt forwards as they are backwards. Palindromes. See if you can remember that word. Impress people and say, I know what palindromes mean. <laughs> it's consistent. And that reminds me about somebody who's always consistent. Who do you think it is? Of course, it's the Lord Jesus, isn't it? He's consistent. He's the same forwards as he is backwards. The Bible tells us in a book called Hebrews, chapter 13, and there in verse 8, it says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do you think that you're consistent? We're not, are we? We're not the same forwards as backwards. Sometimes we're up here and sometimes we're down there and sometimes we do things that are good and other times we do things that are bad. We're very inconsistent, aren't we? We go up and down like a thermometer, don't we? 
up and down. You know, the, 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 the thermometer, when it measures the temperature, it goes up and down. In the winter it's down, and then summer it goes up. It goes up and down. Sometimes throughout the day it goes up and down. That's like us. We're sinners. But Jesus Christ is the same forwards as backwards. And when we trust in Jesus, his life is credited as if we've lived it. And when Jesus died and we trust in him, it's his death is counted as our death. When we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you trusting in him? The one who is consistent. We're going to pray. We're going to especially remember the country of Myanmar and Burma. That whole nation that's in turmoil. We're going to remember them in our pastoral prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we do thank you, O oh God, that Jesus Christ is the same forwards as he is backwards. We thank you for his consistency. We thank you that he rejected every temptation. We thank you that he's our great God. We thank you that he died for our sins. We thank you that when we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that his consistency is counted as ours. Oh, Father, we do pray that we'll be found in Christ. We ask that we'll be trusting in the Lord Jesus as our own Saviour and Lord. And we really pray especially for this world in which we live. We once again lift up this whole pandemic before you. We pray that there'll be great results of the vaccines, Lord. But we do pray especially for countries that are in turmoil. And we think now of Myanmar and we pray for that nation. We ask, O oh God, that you would be pleased to give it rest and blessing and peace. Father, it's been in the news. There's turmoil. And we pray, O oh God, that you would cause there to be stability in that nation again. Watch over it, we pray. May the preachers of the gospel know great liberty. And may people in their restlessness and distress turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in him for full salvation. We ask, O oh Lord, especially for the orphanage that our church is involved in, Father, through our brother John Harris, we pray that you would greatly provide for them as supplies of food on getting through up the mountains. We pray that you would provide for those children and that you, O oh God, would do good in a dire situation. Oh, Father, we pray that you would restore peace. May banks be able to open again. And we pray that the Lord Jesus would reign. You know all things, Lord. And you have power. And you are good. Father we do pray now that you would help us. As we come to this your word. We pray that you would speak to us through your word O oh God. We pray that you would help us in it. We ask that you would speak through your servant. We pray that you would help us to have listening ears in our soul. We ask Lord that you would truly open our eyes. That we may behold wondrous things. Out of your law, we pray for your blessing to be upon it. We ask, O oh God, for your grace and may we be fed in our soul. And may the things of the Lord Jesus be precious to us. Help us, Father. Give us peace and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
thought about the unpardonable sin. Have you ever thought, I might have sinned it? Have you ever been worried that you may have sinned the unpardonable sin? What exactly is it in the first place? These questions and similar questions will be answered in this message. We are looking at the unpardonable sin. And in looking at it, we have two points. Number one, we're going to see forgiveness. And number two, we're going to see forbearance. So number one, forgiveness. There is forgiveness of many sins. And we're going to see later on, there's forbearance of just one sin. Forbearance to forgive of just one sin. Forgiveness and forbearance. So first of all, we notice there is forgiveness. Forgiveness. We're looking at Mark chapter 3, verses 28 to 30. And I find this passage tremendously encouraging. You might say, well, what? how can you find this passage tremendously encouraging? Are you crackers or something? It's about the unpardonable sin. How can you find this passage encouraging? How can you find it positive? Because we get so caught up with the unpardonable sin that we forget what Jesus said just before he spoke about the unpardonable sin. What does Jesus say? He makes a statement regarding forgiveness of sins. What does he tell us? Well, look in verse 28 of Mark 3. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they may utter. There is so many sins that are pardonable. And that is good news, isn't it? That cheers the heart when we're sinners and we know ourselves to be sinners before God. Because let's face it, every single one of us are sinners. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter how rich you are, how poor you are, how educated you are, how well known you are, or how little known you are. The fact of the matter is that every single one of us are sinners. You and me. You're a sinner and I'm a sinner. What is sin? Sin is to break God's law. God has given us laws for our good. And we've broken them. And when it comes into our conscience that we've sinned and that we've failed God and that we know that we've failed God and that we've offended him, we need to seek a remedy. And what cheering news there is that God is a pardoning God. What cheering, reassuring news it is when we've sinned against God that he willingly forgives us of our sins. He takes them away. You see, we blotted our copybooks, haven't we? You ever heard of that expression? He's blotted his copybooks, or she's blotted her copybooks, or I've blotted me copybooks. What it means is that back in the day, before the printing press, what happened was that people used to copy out books. Copy books, and that's how they were distributed. And of course, great care was to be taken in how they were to be copied. And you couldn't make a mistake. You didn't want to blot the copy book. And in the same way, our lives, if you like, it's, a, it's like a, almost like a blank sheet of paper. We've got a bias towards sin and we've blotted our copy books. We've done that which is wrong in God's sight. We've failed God. We are sinners. It's Ryle that's pointed out that if we live to the age of Methuselah, sinners, sinners, sinners we will be we are every one of us have offended God the Bible says for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God but the Lord Jesus comes to us and he says assuredly that is amen it's a true statement really and truly and personally you can have your sins forgiven what super news that is isn't it 
What tremendous news that affords. What great peace that gives to a laboring conscience for those that are under the conviction of sin to know that we can have our sins forgiven. They can be blotted out like a sun and the cloud goes over the sun that our sins can be blotted out as a thick cloud. Blotting out the sun. Our sins can be blotted out. Jesus says that can happen. When we turn to God, he's willing and he's able to forgive us of our sins. What is forgiveness? Jesus says, assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven. He used it again in verse 9. But he blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiven us. What is forgiveness? Well, this word, it means to write something off or to send something away, to send it off. When I worked in secular employment, oftentimes we had a stock take, a stock control take. And there had plenty of stock and you had, to, you had to take down the stock. But of course, there were some missing stock. When the numbers that the computer thought they had of that particular product didn't marry up and there was less of the actual product than the computer thought that it had, then you would write it off. And that is what God in Christ does with our sins. He writes them off. He sends them away. And you say, well, how is that possible? How is it possible that God, who is holy, who has no sin, how is it possible that he can forgive me of my shortcomings and of my failings and of my sins? And the answer is through Jesus Christ. That when we trust in Jesus Christ and come to him confessing our sins and saying, Lord, I'm unworthy. Lord, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me and have mercy upon me. He forgives us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Through his perfect life. He lived a spotless life. One clean life. There was no defects. There was no defilements. There was no imperfections. He lived a perfect clean life. And at the end of his days, he went up to Calvary's hill. And there he died upon the cross and rose again three days later. Ascended into heaven. is in the presence of God the Father. And he forgives. And on that basis, as God looks at his own son, wounds he can forgive us then we can have peace and we can have a clean conscience before God therefore having been justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ we can have a clean conscience we can have a new start we can have forgiveness and we can have pardon of our many many sins through Christ it's through him he assures us we can have forgiveness. A lady was once receiving counsel from a minister. And there's the minister and he was speaking to this lady. And the problem with this lady was that she thought, how can I be forgiven? I can't possibly be forgiven. She thought, it's an inevitability. I'm going to be damned. That's it. There's no hope for me, she said. That's it, as sure as sure can be, I'm going to be damned. My sins are not going to be forgiven me. And she took a glass and she was about to throw it on the floor. And she said to the minister, she said this, As sure as this glass will break on this floor as I throw it down will be as sure as I'll be damned. So she got the glass and she threw it on the ground. When to the surprise of both the lady and the minister, the glass never broke. And what an object lesson that was for the lady. It didn't have to be that way. She didn't have to be damned. It doesn't have to be that way for you. And it doesn't have to be that way for anyone who turns to the Lord Jesus Christ and finds forgiveness of sins through Christ. Assuredly, Jesus says, all. He says, all 
sins will be forgiven the sons of men our sins can be forgiven all of them you remember psalm 103 bless the lord O my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name bless the lord O my soul and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your iniquities if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 9. He forgives us. He pardons us. All of our sins, they're, they're written off. They're wiped away. They're dealt with through the Lord Jesus Christ. Through the wonderful sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross pardoned praise my soul the king of heaven to his feet thy tribute bring ransom healed restored forgiven who like thee his praise should bring praise him praise him will you praise the lord jesus christ what a great news that is this is the very wonder of the gospel isn't it this is the very wonder of it all. This is the very heart of it all. That Jesus left heaven and came down to this world and lived the life he did for us and died on that cross so that we get forgiveness of sins. What a glorious thought it is, isn't it? Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to his cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh my soul. What a great truth it is. That the sins that have so grieved our God. Have been forgiven. Been put away. When you trust Christ. Let me ask. Are your sins forgiven? Have you peace with God? Do you know forgiveness of sins through Jesus? Are they taken away by the Lord Jesus Christ? Now Jesus speaks of blasphemies as well. What's blasphemies? Well, it's to speak impiously of someone. It's to speak horribly of someone. It's to rail of someone. And even if we've committed blasphemies against the Son of God, even they will be forgiven. And will be pardoned when we ask him. And we trust in Jesus Christ. All our sins are taken away. We have peace through Jesus Christ. Forgiveness of sins. Are you watching this video? And you haven't known that forgiveness. You've never come to know Jesus Christ as your own saviour and lord. Is that you? Oh, I would urge you to turn to Christ. I would urge you to, to ask him to forgive you of your sins. I would plead with you to stop dithering, to stop delaying, to stop holding out, to stop making excuses, to come to God in Christ now and to say, Lord, forgive me. We need no other opportunities, if you like. How do we know how many will even have anyway? Jesus has made that statement that there are so many sins that are forgivable. Oh friend, turn to Christ. Don't dither. Don't delay. Don't hold out. Come to him right now. Trust in Jesus Christ. But maybe you are a believer. And you know the joy of sins forgiven. And it is a joy. It helps you through life. Whatever trials we go through. Whatever difficulties we encounter. Whatever situations come across our path. We know. Ah. My sins are forgiven. We know. Ah. My biggest issue is sorted. Ah. My conscience is clean before God. There's no controversy between me and my maker. It's glorious. 
It's a wonderful thing a Christian has. Our sins are forgiven. And whatever we're not, and whatever inadequacies we have, that's the joy that we can know. The joy of sins forgiven. David said, blessed is the man, truly happy is the man whose sins are forgiven, and aggression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Psalm 32, verse 1. Oh, and it helps us with ongoing sin, doesn't it? Because when we trust in Christ, when we're believers in the Lord Jesus, we battle with sin, don't we? We still let the Lord down. We still fail him so often. We still offend him. We still have wrong thoughts. We still have those wrong words. We still have those wrong attitudes. We still offend him. Ah, oh, but our sins are forgiven. Ah, oh, but he's a pardoning God. Oh yes, I can turn to him again. And he receives me again. And he welcomes me again. And he's a glorious saviour. That brings me in and dusts me down. And forgives us of our sins. And it gives hope for people. While there's life, there is hope. While there's life. There's hope. There's hope for a dying world. There's hope for this sin sick world. There's hope for people who've spurned the gospel many times before. There's hope. And it's in Jesus Christ. Pray on for people. Tell on. Praying and telling on about Jesus. Praying to Jesus for souls and telling souls about Jesus. Because there's hope in the gospel. There's forgiveness in the gospel of our Christ. So there's forgiveness of many sins. Secondly, there's forbearance of one sin. So there's forgiveness of many sins, but there is forbearance of one sin. So what of the unpardonable sin? Jesus has made this glorious statement in verse 28 about forgiveness. Great. But he also makes this statement in verse 29 about the unpardonable sin. So what of it? What is the unpardonable sin? Well, as in every case, the context of the Bible is so important. We mustn't get things out of context. We mustn't twist things. We mustn't crowbar verses out of the original context in which they are placed. Context is king. And it's true here, very much so. What's happening? What's the context? There are scribes who have been sent from Jerusalem, as we saw last time. And these are your big scribes. They're not just little scribes. They're not even middle-ranking scribes. They're your big boys from Jerusalem. And what happens is that these big boys from Jerusalem, what do they do? They go up to Capernaum, where the Lord Jesus is, and they've got to suss out what they think about this person, Jesus. He's causing a stir. There's people from all over Israel that are coming to hear about this Jesus. And these big boys, these Ofsted if you like, these, this big management, these temple authorities, they've been told, go and assess this man Jesus. So off they go. And this is their verdict in chapter 3, verse 22. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. Their verdict was very serious. What did they say? They said this. Jesus is doing the work of the devil. That's what they were saying. It's awful, isn't it? That's what they were saying. He has Beelzebub. He has the spirit of Satan about him. That's what they were accusing Jesus of. It's awful, isn't it? Fancy accusing any servant of Jesus to be doing the devil's work, but even more awful to be accusing the Lord Jesus Christ 
of doing this work. And they were saying it's satanic. And it's on the back of that that Jesus explains that they're wrong. He defends himself. And he does so by the means of illustrations. And then he goes on to talk about the unpardonable sin. It's in the light of that. And it's in the light of that particularly because in verse 30, Mark adds this little note in, you see, that says this. Because they said, he has an unclean spirit. Again, he's putting in the context. He's saying, look, don't get this out of context about the unpardonable sin. It's not for us to be going around accusing people they've committed the unpardonable sin. Jesus is speaking to these extreme, sinful, debauched scribes. Religious leaders who should have known better. What he was saying is this. They were accusing Jesus, who had the Spirit of God working in him, they were accusing Jesus, that work that was the Spirit of God's work, to be devilish. And we know that it was the Spirit of God that was a work because Matthew's parallel account of this section tells us it was done by the Spirit of God. Jesus was performing these wonderful things in casting out demons. He was doing it by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God was working through Jesus. And they were saying that work of the Spirit of God is of the devil, they were saying. Whew, that was strong, isn't it? That's how debauched they had got. And so it's on the back of that that Jesus is explaining in verse 29, but he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, which is what the scribes were doing, Never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. What is the unpardonable sin? The way I understand it from Scripture is this when someone sees a work of the Spirit of God and they attribute it and they ascribe it to the devil. That is the unpardonable sin. That is, and that is only the unpardonable sin. It is extreme, and I think it is rare to go to that extreme. It is very extreme. And don't forget the importance of what we would describe as willful sin, and sins done in ignorance. Now all sin is serious. Of course it is. It's an offence against God. All sin is bad. But there are sins that are done in ignorance. And there are sins that are done very willfully. Paul said didn't he? I did this in ignorance. Now it doesn't excuse him. It doesn't get him off the hook. And it certainly isn't any merit toward God in that. Of course not. But it is telling isn't it? When someone does a willful sin and when someone does a sin in ignorance. Now both are sins of course, but there's all the difference in the world. These scribes in the clear light of day, in their verdict, in their conclusion and their conviction, were saying, this man is devilish. That's what they were saying. It was a strong conviction. It was something that they had come to deliberately. It wasn't an off the hand statement. It was done willfully and it was done with full intent. And that's telling. Because not often I don't think that that sin is committed. But Jesus says whatever it is. Fortunately, there's no pardon. And it does show the importance of the Holy Spirit, doesn't it? The Holy Spirit is so important. The third person of the Trinity. The one who is equal with God the Father and God the Son. 
the one who eternally proceeded from the Father and from the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the dove-like being, he mustn't be offended. We mustn't quench the Spirit. And that word for quench, it's like a fire extinguisher. In fact, the word there for quench is extinguish. There's a fire that rages. You get out the extinguisher and you try and dampen it down. And that's what happens. There's the fire of the Spirit that works and we can quench the Spirit of God. We can quench Him. We mustn't do that. We can grieve the Spirit. And that's in Ephesians and, and chapter 4, in those practical chapters of Ephesians. And for Ephesians 4, 30, And do not grieve this Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And what does it mean to grieve the Spirit? Well, Paul goes on and says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamour, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. You see, those are the things that grieve the Spirit. And I'm sure we've grieved the Spirit, haven't we? We've not, we, I'm not saying you've sinned the unpardonable sin. Please, I'm not saying that. But every one of us has grieved the Spirit, haven't we? Every one of us has decided that we'd rather have our own wisdom instead of the Spirit's wisdom or that we've just plain ignored the Spirit of God entirely and not even sought His counsel. And open the scriptures and just wanted our, our own interpretation. Instead of wanting the Spirit of God to be my teacher. Spirit of God, my teacher be showing the things of Christ to me. I love Luther's hymn. Come Holy Spirit, God and Lord. Be all thy blessings now outpoured on the believer's mind and soul. To strengthen, save and make us whole. How we need forgiveness for grieving the Spirit. And praise the Lord that that is pardonable. And praise the Lord that when we come back again as we have this so often. And say sorry Lord for ignoring and grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit of God. He forgives us of even that sin. But the Holy Spirit is so important. Sins against the Holy Spirit. You remember Ananias and Sapphira. Again, I'm not saying they sinned the unpardonable sin, but they sinned against the Spirit. Ananias lied against the Spirit. Sapphira lied against the Spirit, didn't she? When she came in about three hours later and they had agreed together to lie. They'd agreed together to grieve the Spirit of God. And they dropped dead. Sins against the Holy Spirit. They're serious, aren't they? And then there's this unpardonable sin. In a very debauched way. Of going beyond any hope of return. It's a serious thing, isn't it? Very. But there are some pastoral implications about the unpardonable sin that I must talk to you about. And it's this. Some people are very worried that they've committed it. Have you ever been worried that you've committed the unpardonable sin? Friend, let me give you every assurance that if you are bothered that you have committed the unpardonable sin, friend, it is almost proof positive you haven't. The unpardonable sin. What is characteristic of a person who's committed it? It's impenitence. It's a blasé attitude about sin, isn't it? It's about somebody who couldn't care less. It's about somebody who's not bothered about their sin and they're hardened. That's the person, I think, who commits the unpardonable sin, don't you? But when someone comes and says, I'm so worried, I'm worried I've committed it, it's almost certain you haven't. Because that's the type of person who comes running to Jesus for forgiveness. That's the type of person who has forgiveness of their sins. So rest assured, this is an extreme case. This was primarily directed to these scribes 
who had gone too far in their opposition to Christ. And Jesus says, when someone does that, against the Holy Spirit and sees the work of the Spirit of God and says Satan has done that in the clear light of day. Jesus then says that's unpardonable. But that's rare I think. Saul in all his antagonism against the church, Saul of Tarsus, in all his hostility against the church, in all his false zeal, he never committed the unpardonable sin. All his sins were forgiven. In Corinth, when Paul had to write to them in 1 Corinthians and list all these manner of, of awful sins and they're terrible, aren't they? And he says, and such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Even those people in Corinth didn't go that far. They were forgiven. And so rest assured this must never be an excuse. Oh, I've sinned the unpardonable sin. Therefore I can't come to Christ. He's not going to forgive me. Friend, no, 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 no. There is forgiveness in so many sins and in so many iniquities that we've sinned against the Lord Jesus says he who comes to me I'll by no means cast out whoever comes to me they may have sunk deep into sin they can still be forgiven an old writer said this your misery does not exceed his mercy. Your misery does not exceed his mercy. In other words, wherever our misery is, wherever our sin is, his mercy covers wider. Wherever sin abounded, grace did abound much more. And there is this forgiveness of sins with Jesus. Praise his name. Oh, you may have sunk deep. You may have sung far, but friend, there is hope. Friend, oh, that you would come to Christ and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. And he'll pardon you. He'll take it away. And he'll set you on the right way. And he'll give you everlasting consolation. In him. In, that's in Christ we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace
Heavenly Father, we do thank you and we do praise you for your mercies, O God. We praise you, O Lord, for your great grace toward us in the Lord Jesus. Father, we are sinners, but Father, we do thank you and we do praise you and we do worship you, that you are a very kind God to sinners, Lord. We thank you that you give us forgiveness and we thank you that you give us peace with yourself and we thank you that we can be at home with you. Oh, Father, we thank you that you've told us in your word about the unpardonable sin and although we find it very difficult, Lord, we thank you that Jesus is head over heels before telling us about the unpardonable sin to tell us that there is forgiveness of so many sins. Oh, Father, we pray that you would help us to come to Christ. May we know our sins forgiven. May we know the peace of God in our lives. Help us, O Lord, we pray. And may your mercy rest upon us in Christ. Please be near us, O Lord. Give us grace. Watch over us. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Saviour who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever.